I'm here with Deb Goldberg, who is a Democratic candidate for state treasurer. Thanks for participating. Well, it's great to be here today. Um, we're going to get right to the format of the interview, and this will be a live to tape interview. That means no edits once we begin. There was no pre-screening of questions, and answers will be limited to two minutes each. We will start with a one-minute opening statement from the candidate, and after the questions, we will conclude with a one-minute closing statement. So, Ms. Goldberg, you now have one minute for an opening statement. Thank you. So, I think it's important for me to share with people why I am running for state treasurer. And I'm running to give every woman, every man, every child the financial power and skills they need to get ahead in this tough economy. Economic security, economic stability, and economic empowerment aren't just buzzwords to me. They are a personal mission that I come to naturally from the way I was grown up and the things that I was exposed to. And I believe that I can bring those issues into the treasurer's office and make a real difference for people moving forward. And I look forward to sharing with you more and more of what I can do as the state treasurer. Thanks very much. So we'll, we will get right uh, to the questions, and um, I'm sure I don't need to remind you, but I'm going to anyway, that, we will, that you will have up to two minutes and no more to answer each question. Um, so the first one is, why are you running for state treasurer and what prepares you to serve in this capacity? Well, that is actually a perfect segue from what I opened with because I can take it from there. Um, you know, my mother's great-grandmother, you and I were talking about immigration before we came on, came with her 11 children to the north end of Boston and started a small grocery store. And every single friend or relative that arrived had a, a roof over their heads and a job. That grew into stop and shop, and it was those families together, together. It was about economic security and economic stability, and I worked there, first as a member of Union Local 1445 and later on in executive roles. After I went to college at BU, after receiving my law degree at Boston College, and then later on after having my MBA at Harvard. But we went through a hostile takeover, and we were pushed out because we would not fire our families. And that was good jobs, union jobs. We had brought in the unions ourselves. It was about economic security and stability. And I turned to the, to the public sector. I had gone to Harvard Business School. I saw what was going on on Wall Street and what was happening in the corporate world. And I focused on women, children, and families and ran for local office and found that I could bring my business and finance skills but very importantly also my values of helping to create what was originally my mission, which was making sure that two to three generations of families had economic stability and bringing it into the public sector. That was the reason why I came into public service and have done many things in that area. I am the president of an adoption agency. I was one of the founders and the treasurer of a school for kids with severe cognitive disabilities. I know you have an education background, so you understand the, the challenges in that. I'm an advisor at the Greater Boston Food Bank because I inherently feel hunger and security is immoral in this country. So that's what I bring to Thanks the Treasurer's Thanks very much. Office. We're going to move on to the next question, um, which is, do you believe the State Treasurer has been an aggressive watchdog on behalf of taxpayers? And if you wouldn't mind, please give us specific examples to justify your answer one way or the other. Well, the re that's an excellent question because so many people don't even know what the Treasurer does. And it's really an executive function of, for someone who has a business and a finance background and is the watchdog for taxpayers' dollars. All taxpayers' dollars are moved over into the treasurer's office, and so it is critical that one is transparent and open. The present treasurer has put the state's checkbook online. If you want to know what someone's paid in the state, you put in their name, and it goes right in, and up it comes. This is a very critical thing, and this level of transparency can be extended over time. There are more than nine departments at the treasurer's office. I believe the budget for every department should be available to be seen. This treasurer has also saved money through bidding out who, who does our cash management, who holds our funds, um, debt management, and has realized 
greater than anticipated gains in the pension fund, which then more fully funds the pension system. That's the kind of work I did on the local level. I, I come from Brookline. I was chairman of the board of selectmen there, worked with the retirement board, and worked on ways that we more fully fund the pension, that we are reducing the length of time it will take to do that by examining investments, creating greater than anticipated gains, and then doing actuarials to reevaluate is our, in, is our rate correct? Can we reduce it? And in doing so, uh, Brookline system will be fully funded by 2030, and it will be a sustainable um, way of going about it at 7%. That's the orientation I bring to the treasurer's office and the expertise on how we move forward. Thanks very much. Um, can you please give us two examples of how you think the state treasurer could have done more or better? You've just cited some accomplishments, but more or better um, over the last four years. Um, in terms of more, it, uh, I think that I would, I would go and talk, I would talk about the financial literacy program. Financial literacy has begun under the treasurer's office under our present treasurer but it is a grant program. And when I look at the kind of harm that occurred in 2008, 2009, um, I know people who lost their homes. I also know people who bought homes not understanding what they were getting into. We need to develop a robust statewide financial literacy program that is built into the present curriculum, the math curriculum, as early as fourth grade, we could be teaching basic financial literacy skills if those questions were built into the curriculum that way. And we also want to reach out to immigrants, minorities, who were the, were the most susceptible to those kind of things. Um, I believe that we should be educating seniors on things like uh, reverse mortgages, which are coming back fast and furious and is a vehicle that is not good estate planning for most of the seniors. And we can use the outreach in the treasurer's office that is presently within the unclaimed property division. And, and make sure that kids in particular in high school learn about debt, college debt, federal government loans that even if they were to go into personal bankruptcy they would still all owe on. I stand shoulder to shoulder with Elizabeth Warren on that issue, and she's the one fighting to get rid of those onerous loans because it's almost criminal that we do this to our kids. So I think financial literacy is a really important area that is game changing for a lot of people. That is economic empowerment. That's the financial skills I'm talking about. Um, next question is, what specific proposals would you seek to implement to help the state economy, create jobs, and attract business to the Commonwealth? That's not a two minute question <laughs> <No>. <laughs> at all. Because you're talking to a business person, a business person who worked throughout the state. But I will answer it in the context specifically of the treasurer's office as briefly as I can. Uh, number one, let's start with school building assistance. Um, making sure that we're not, it, it, it affects the economy in so many ways. One is, you can ask any of the trades or people in the construction business, how did they get through the economic downturn? Through building and renovating our schools. So that's over $600 million a year out to the communities, out creating jobs in the construction industry, but it also, in the most important way, is creating the 21st century classrooms where we're gonna train the kids for the jobs that are coming into Massachusetts. Um, 21st century jobs in Massachusetts are in healthcare fields, are in biotech, are in high tech. And so consequently, we have a moral obligation, I, I talk moral a lot, to give the kids the opportunities to learn these skills. And so they need the classrooms to do that. Um, one more thing that I, I would be helping with, again, in terms of focusing on kids, a college savings plan at no cost to the taxpayer. So no competition on line items in the legislature. So adding, not subtracting. For all kids ID'd on the free lunch program, 
$50, it's based upon bank fees. They learn financial literacy, having a college savings fund, but also they are, it's already been proven seven times more likely to go to college. Now I'm about folks schools and apprenticeship programs also. But again, as I mentioned, the jobs that could be here, that we're losing those companies out of the innovation district and they're moving elsewhere for the skilled workforce that we're I'm not sorry. providing. We do have to move help. on. Um, <clears throat> are you satisfied with the, you mentioned this earlier, but are you satisfied with the present state pension system? Um, and if elected, would you pursue pension reform? And if so, could you give us two specific examples of what that would be? In terms of the actual pension fund, um, Massachusetts will be fully funded right now as of today in 2036. I believe in my years of hoping to be the state treasurer, we will reduce that. Massachusetts is double A1 or double A plus rated by Moody's and Standard & Poor's. They are not concerned about the level of our funding in our pension system. In the last five years, we've seen enormous reform. That will save billions of dollars moving forward. And we've just begun to see the impact of those reforms. So we're very, very well positioned. Additionally, Massachusetts was number two in the country in gains this year. Number one was California, which is a country all by itself. <laughs> so I will come in and I will be managing the pension fund with a very similar strategy to what we have now and have had that experience already. I mentioned that the contributory retirement system that's within the community that I come from is in very good shape and we are AAA bond rated. We're not AAA bond rated not because of the pension system but of a curious way in which we manage our debt in Massachusetts. Many, many states throw debt off into a county system. We do not. So we carry everyone's debt in Massachusetts, but it's not because of the pension fund. I do think, however, we need to be looking at post-retirement benefits. No one has tackled that issue, and we need to be able to work together with the retirees, with, with everyone, to determine streams of revenues that we will be able to put in to begin fully, the, fully funding those obligations. That is something I will be working on with mass retirees, with the unions, with the legislature, and looking at how we will get that done, because it's critical for communities and it's critical at the state level. Thanks, thanks for that response. <clears throat> Please explain how the current distribution of lottery funds ah, work, yes. and if elected, whether you would pursue changes. And again, if you would, could you give us specific examples? Yes, absolutely. Um, I was as surprised as so many were in reading the Globe article this past summer and seeing the incredible inequity in the distribution of lottery dollars. Um, you know, I didn't craft the deal back in the 70s when 2.5% was put in and it was determined that the lottery would take the place of local aid. This is kind of a, from a business person's point of view, but also a progressive's point of view. This is a kind of interesting way that we're, an interesting quote unquote way in which we're funding services. Um, I was shocked to find out it is the legislature that makes that determination. And as treasurer, I feel that is inequitable. Um, I am, you and I are both aware that communities starving for additional resources put a lot of money through their citizens into the lottery. And so I intend to pressure and push the legislature to have a transparent, a transparent approach to looking at the lottery distribution formula. Now, my job will be to make sure that not only do the, do the billion dollars in unrestricted general funds continue to flow to every city and town in the Commonwealth, think about this past winter, no community had in their budget the amount of snow removal that they needed to do. And believe it or not, lottery dollars paid for that. So it is a critical piece of local aid for every community coming out of the local level. I get that. And so my job will be to make sure that we continue to have a robust lottery and that no matter what happens, we increase it because costs are constantly going up. Mm -hmm. So, but I was quite stunned to hear about that and that the legislature is the one who does it. Thanks. Moving on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Um, please give us an example of an issue that you and your opponents agree on, and then two examples of issues on which you differ, and in the latter case, why your positions uh, represent the best interests of the Commonwealth. Wow. Hmm. Um, because we often do ag agree on things, but I think the thing that jumps out of my head because it's timely is casino gambling. All three of us do not support casino gambling. And so I think that stands on its own. Um, in terms of the way we disagree, um, oh, that's a really good one. I'm, I'm, I, I think that we probably disagree on um, in in gradations. You know, different. Mm -hmm. It's gray. Um, I have been an extremely strong public school supporter. Uh, the public schools accept every child that arrives at their doors. And so I, and having been a local elected official who is very fiscally prudent, even though I'm a progressive, um, I would stand at, in Brookline Town Meeting, support divestment of fossil fuels, getting rid of plastic bags, getting rid of styrofoam cups, and leading um, on a resolution against the Patriot Act. But at the same time would say, we don't do anything that violates the AAA bond rating. So bringing those, those two points of view together, I have not been a proponent of charter schools. Um, at different times, one of, one of my opponent is a big, opponents is a big proponent of charter schools, and the other has voted to raise the cap. As long as the funding stays the way it is, I believe in school choice for parents, but I don't think that charter schools should be competing with public schools, and that the public schools are as, as are very challenged. And as someone who had to help the budget process, and then six months later, just before school starts, would lose a lot of money, a lot of dollars traveling with students out of the district. This is not a fair way to expect communities that are already cash-strapped. Um, next, next to last question is, what makes you the best candidate for this office? I think what makes me the best candidate is several things. Number one, I often talk about what does the treasurer do, because I think that's differentiating in terms of my background. The treasurer has 800 employees. 400 of them are unionized. I'm the only person in this race that has ever negotiated a collective bargaining agreement. And from the management side, the unions that I worked with in the private sector are supporting me, and all my public safety and, and teachers and AFSCME unions are also supporting me. Not because I gave away the store, but because of the kind of relationships and the work that I know how to do, that we're all in this together. And it's about moving forward together with respect, with friendship, but also understanding when you sit at the table that you have to get the job done. Um, neither of my opponents have that kind of experience. I come from a broad general management experience. There are nine or more departments and responsibilities within the treasurer's office. And I am an extremely progressive person politically. And I know how to balance running cash management, debt, debt management, unclaimed properties, managing and investing the pension fund, while also investing in people. It's when I talk about economic stability and economic security, I learned how to do that from a very young age and successfully did it in the public sector. I think that background, that experience, that lens, and knowing how to get it done, that's, you know, we can all share the same values and the same goals but also knowing how to get it done in that environment. This is an executive position. This is a management job. And I believe that although my colleagues in the race have very good experience, I looked at this when people asked me to, and I said, only if I could be passionate about the job and know I could do Thank a good you. job. I believe that's the case. Moving on, we will take the last question, which is, what strategies would you use um, for working with members of other parties and with others of opposing views, and what experience do you have implementing those strategies? That's actually a fairly easy question, because I think one of the things about coming from local elected leadership is it's nonpartisan or it's bipartisan, 
whichever way you want to look at it. Um, when I first ran for selectman that very first time, what was fascinating is the coalition against, against unfair taxation endorsed me and Brookline PAX endorsed me. Those people had never sat at the same table. Why, you say? For the very reason why I will make um, what I think is the best state treasurer. Because the coalition knew I knew how to run it well. They knew I cared about the AAA bond rating. They knew when I ran the audit committee, I would be examining every one of those numbers. Or when I sat down and looked at the budget, I would figure out the way to make it work. That's what they care about. Well, my progressive values, I wear on my sleeve. I mean, when I was seven years old, my dad put me in my snowsuit in Michael Dukakis's coffee truck, and it wasn't when he was running for governor. It was when he ran for state rep. And I have been a progressive Democrat ever since. You and I talked about my work on the moratorium against the war in Vietnam. I am a Democratic activist. Today I'm a town meeting member, and even though it was a week or two before the um, convention for elect, you know, getting on the ballot, I was at town meeting because I wanted to make sure not to miss divestment of fossil fuels, warrant Article 24. And so I bring political activism and progressive values and yet very strong business background. And that is what is appealing to everyone. There are a lot of Republicans who I know who are going to vote for Deb, and it's because they know I will do a good job with what they care about. They care about running the businesses well, and that's what I'm referring to. Sorry to cut you Thank off. Thank you. <laughs> You're good at it, though. That ends this portion of the interview, and uh, flew by, I'm sure, for you. Uh, but you do have uh, one minute for a closing argument. I think that the state treasurer's position is one that a lot of people don't understand or know much about, and yet you want to make sure that you have a state treasurer who is transparent, who is someone that you know that you can trust to not only do all the jobs within the treasurer's office, but will stand and fight for wage equality, um, financial literacy, the college savings plan that I talked about, who knows how to balance the job of the treasurer and progressive values. I believe that I bring all of those things to the table because I know deep within myself that opportunity is the most important thing in life and I pledge to do everything to make that possible for all of the people of Massachusetts. It would be an honor to be your treasurer and I hope that you will vote Deb Goldberg on September 9th. Thank you. And we want to thank Ms. Goldberg for participating in our conversation. Please make your voice count by voting at the state primary on September 9th. For Arlington Public News, this is James Milan. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.